held and carried out, encouraging you to be a smart, active, and inventive young intellectual with a strong sense of problem solving and empathy. Recording in progress. A place where art, technological innovation, culture, and diversity come together with Islamic values in a way that inspires and opens new windows to the world. A place where modernization, driven by the rapid advancement of the educational sector and technology, provides you with the best means to stay connected to various learning processes both on and off the network. The technology that runs along the traditions of Nusantara while upholding the Islamic values. In this place where knowledge meets passion and dreams come true, at Universitas Yarsi, the pursuit of knowledge extends beyond the confines of the lecture hall, turning into an adventurous journey with each chapter unfolding, a place where individuals are free to explore and express themselves, optimize their talents and creativity, and leverage all the opportunities and resources available to support them in exploring knowledge, both theoretically in the study room and practically in the state-of-the-art and modern research room, to the social and professional environment as a form of social responsibility and self-actualization of every element Universitas Yarsi to spread benefits, advance, and educate the nation. A place where individuals are also nurtured to reach their full potential, equipped with Islamic knowledge, skills, and capabilities to face various global challenges and competition, a process that molds an excellent young generation. In San Camille, who not only excels academically, but also actively contributes to solving global issues and challenges. Universitas Yarsi bertekad untuk melahirkan sumber daya manusia yang tidak hanya unggul di dalam ilmu pengetahuan teknologi dan seni, tapi juga dibekali dengan keimanan dan ketakwaan kepada Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Di samping juga cakap, mandiri, inovatif, serta siap menjadi warga negara yang bertanggung jawab untuk kemajuan umat, bangsa, dan negara Indonesia tercinta. Yayasan Jarsi berkemudian penuh mendukung Ibsa Siarsi dalam rangka mewujudkan peguan tinggi Islam yang terpandang, berwibawa, bermutu tinggi, dan mampu bersaing dalam forum nasional maupun internasional. Yayasan Darsi mendukung sepenuhnya kegiatan pendidikan, penelitian, dan pengabdian kepada masyarakat sehingga dapat diwujudkan masyarakat yang sejahtera, adil, dan makmur. This is a place where you can begin to shape your dreams and goals, bringing them to fruition until you achieve the highest peak of success you have always dreamed of. A place you can rely on to support you in achieving all your hopes, transforming you into an excellent young generation who are ready to rebuild the glory of Islam and make Indonesia advance and strong. Here at Universitas Yarsi, the smart campus that you can... Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin wa bihi nasta'in wa ala umuri dunya waddin wa salatu wassalamu ala asyrofil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain amma ba'du. First the presence of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala who always gives us blessings and gifts. So today we are able to join today summer school. Salawat and salam may always be poured out to the great Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who has brought us to the path of light from darkness in this life. I'm Andre Zahran and my partner. I'm Afak Zuhalaili. We are your master of ceremony this morning. We would like to welcome the Honorable Mrs. Nadia El Mulhi, PhD from Halal Certification Authority Australia who has willing to be speaker of today's session. Ladies and gentlemen, in, the, in this special morning, we have several agendas as follows. 
First, the opening of today's session. The second, the lecturing by Nadia El Mulhi, PhD. The third session, photo session, and the fourth, closing of today's session. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin this agenda today by reciting Basmalah together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Before we jump to the main session, welcome one and all in today's session of YRC Summer School. Yes, a warm welcome to each of you. Let's dive into the world of knowledge and learning, learning together. Okay, uh, it's great to be here, Lyle, and to explore the, this important topic. Uh, the topic is Australia's halal certifica certification industry has been significant growth in recent years, but it's also faced its fair share for challenge. That's right. From aligning with inter international standards to ensuring the compliance with local regulation, there's a lot that goes into obtaining and maintaining halal certification in Australia. Absolutely. And let's not forget the global impact of Australia's halal certification efforts. The country has become a key player in the global halal market, and thanks to its high standards and commitment to quality. Yes. Indeed, Australia's success in the halal certification industry is a testament, testament to its dedication to meeting the needs of Muslim consumers worldwide. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers today who will shed more light on these topics. Yes, we're excited to hear from our speakers and learn more about the challenge and triumphs of halal certification in, ha in Australia. So without any further ado, let's begin our main session. All right, the second agenda is a lecturing that will be conveyed by our speaker with the topic Halal Down Under, Unfailing Australia Certification Challenges and Global Triumphs. Okay, uh, let me call upon Dr. Insinyur Ani Setianingrum, MESY Postgraduate Program, as the moderator and also our speaker of the day, Nadia El Mulhi, PhD, to start the session. Before we start, I will read the curriculum vitae of Dr. Insinyur Ani Setianingrum, MESY, as a moderator. She was born at 16 November 1969 and now as full time lecturer with teaching focus interdisciplinary aspects in Islamic economics and finance. For activities in the areas as Sharia banking and finance management, research method, ethics and governance, leadership entrepreneurship, and Sharia economics law. And for further education as a doctoral program of Islamic economics in Airlangga University, with personal background or experience in Durham Islamic Finance Summer School 2019 in UK and the second Leiden University as early Islamic Empire organ organized by research project in building Concuse in Netherlands, Netherlands 2019. For work experience in general as lecturer and researcher in the Master of Management in YRC University and associate editor at Inter International Journal of Islamic Microfinance, DPYIAEI DKI Jakarta and as international board at Advanced Research in Social Science, the Government Sadiq College Women University, Bahawalpur, Pakistan. Okay. Um, before we start the main session, let's uh, let's let us. Um, Call upon for oh, both Dr. Oh. Insinyur Anisa Tiang Ningrum, M.E.S.Y., and Nadia El Mulhi, Ph.D., and the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, MC. Bismillah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. 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 Ala Muhammad. Distinguished speaker, Nadia Elmuli, PhD. Distinguished all of lecturer and all academic. And dear broad or participant, thank you for finding the time and visiting today's webinar. Alhamdulillah, happening now, YRC University Summer School 2024, prospect of embracing and Navigating the future in Islamic economic and business. 
My name is Anis Janingrum. As a researcher and halal consumer, I'm so delighted, eager to engage with today halal issues. Brother and sister, now the concept of halal is not only related to religious issue, but also science and technology. Halal has become a symbol of good quality drugery and Indonesia become a large market promoting and developing halal product and lifestyle, not just for Muslim, but for non-Muslim. Globally, halal product trade in the world increased to trillion of rupiah or million of dollars and increased annually. According to the State of Global Islamic Economy Report, 2018-2019, Muslim total global expenditure on the halal lifestyle reached $2.1 trillion in 2017. The increase is very rapid in many areas. Economic finance, food and leverage, medicines, cosmetic, tourism hotel, transportation, and so forth. Brother and sister, now we have Sister Nadia. Good afternoon, Sister Nadia, which is currently on Australia time, right? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful welcome and a great introduction from um, Yasi University and yourself. Okay, Nadia. We are grateful that you are here with us today. Alhamdulillah, we are fine too. As we know, Sister Nadia will present her work, Halal Don Under, Unveiling Australia Certification Challenges and Global Triumph. It's my pleasure to kick off season uh, third day. Before moving to main presentation, let me read Nadia's quick profile. Yeah. Nadia studies are in science, Islamic science, food safety, human resources management, occupational health and safety, small business management, trainer, the trainer including her patient within quantum linguistic and neurological repatterning, to name a few. Nadia involved in halal certification for 30 years. As the first female halal certifier in the world, Nadia Brands ought to successfully direct the largest process good regulatory body in Australia called Halal Certification Authority, which is one of the larger certifiers in the world. She has offices in China, Europe, and Australia. In 2020, Cambridge announced her as one of the top 300 most influential women in the Islamic economic worldwide. She now stands as the only female in Australia with this specialist area is Islamic jurisprudence known as halal. Nadia has also received various awards from, from international institutions in the field of charity, leadership, and education. Brother and sister, before the presentation begins, let me tell you how this workshop will run. Sister Nadia in this season will have one hour and a half for the presentation. Following that, we will have a question and answer session for approximately 30 minutes. And finally, the season will be ended by a conclusion. And all participants can use the chat feature in this session to ask your question. However, the moderator will select and ask some question or allow attendees who raise their hand to speak and ask question. And don't forget to mention your name and institution. If you need help with anything technical, please contact the committee assistant through the chat function. And let me remind everyone to mute the microphone during the presentation session in order to be considerate and respectful to everyone attending and 
presenting today. Please, all attendees, um, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome Sister Nadia to present her work for about one hour and a half. Nadia, time is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, moderator. Um, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm just going to share the screen. Uh, yep. So I hope you're all well today. And we'll be learning a lot about Australia. Um, and a lot of people actually probably don't realize how large Australian halal certification is um, being such a secular non-Muslim country. So let's get into it um, with uh, halal down under and we'll be unveiling the certification challenges that Australia went through and what these triumphs led to. So of course we'll do obviously, sorry, I'm just gonna move this. Um, we will, I know it's very obvious um, as Muslims, we know what halal and haram is, but the sake and just in case there's someone that's not Muslim here today, that halal just means permissible and haram means not permissible. I am going to speak about what is haram. I do feel like we do know this predominantly, but there's a reason why I've segregated these products. The top five are usually five products that no one predominantly wants to eat. Um, however, that is not to say in some countries, um, such as uh, Scotland, there's blood sausages. Um, in America or in, in westernised countries, you have placenta peels as human parts. We have in, I believe, uh, some places in India, um, there's urine placed on herbs. Um, and also, so these are, there are few countries that have these types of things. And these are things that are um, obviously weary and extremely haram for us as Muslims. So these are, just to put a, a preface to what we're discussing. So today we'll be discussing specifically what led to the development of halal certification in Australia. So it was rather informal as it started. Muslims, so Australia is actually a colonisation of the United Kingdom or London. So there is actually evidence of Muslims coming on that ship in the 1700s to Australia. But back then, of course, halal certification is not prevalent. And if there was any slaughter to take place, it probably would have just been on the side of the road or outside their, you know, shed, so to speak. And even then, it might have not been possible because um, Australia was under colonisation. So some people that were brought there were um, people that were part of the same management or colonisation, but there would have been a, a lot of convicts that came. So it's very interesting how it all came about. But let's skip another 100 years and get into the gold rush. The gold rush happened because in Australia we had gold, obviously. And what happened then is a lot of Muslims and a lot of other people actually came to see if they could make it rich. So this is how Muslims started to um, come into Australia because um, without Muslims, we can't really start councils and we can't really start uh, Islamic cooperations for us to even start a process to even begin with certification. Just to add um, about Australia, in 1879, the first refrigerated meat shipments actually came from Australia. So actually Australia was the first to design the ability for frozen meat or refrigerated meat to leave a country and end up in another country. And you can imagine back then, ships and voyages would take months to reach another place. There was another shipment that was um, done to France, I believe from Argentina. Uh, this was not successful. The, the, the ship reached successfully, but the, the, the meat was inedible. And the reason why this happened was because 
the Industrial Revolution did happen within Australia specifically because of England. So because of our relationship with England. So let's move along to how halal certification or even halal slaughter even took place. So in 1948, Mr. Afif, a Pakistani immigrant, was the first to introduce halal export. I don't believe he was the first to do halal slaughter because like I said to you, there were people that came upon settlement to do slaughter and they would have been looking after themselves. In this capability, um, no doubt these first exports would have been to Pakistan. There's actually evidence in the court documents here in Australia that are very, and, and everything here is public, that in um, 1956, Mr. Sadiq Bucks had a halal slaughtering and inspection service um, in Western Australia. And this business actually later went into a halal certification be, um, business. Both these um, men are no longer with um, us anymore. And, um, but they were the earliest signs that we have as evidence, especially as an academic or a research researcher. So in 1970s, so how Australia became pro prolific predominantly in wanting halal is that in 1970, there was a major influx of Muslims into Australia. And this was sorry, specifically because of the Lebanese civil war. And Lebanon is about 60% Muslim. So we probably, the Muslims, uh, sorry, the, the Lebanese that were coming in and a lot of Europeans were coming in at that time um, into Australia. It was also because in, I believe, 1901, there used to be an immigration restriction act. So you really couldn't get into Australia. Whereas this has been lifted in 1973 and it allowed a lot of people to come in and immigrate, uh, to immigrate into Australia. So in about 1974, there was a man called Mr. Katani. He had another person along with him. And they went, they came from the Saudi, the Saudi government. And they went to every state in Australia. And they were examining and looking at the Islamic councils that had formed and some of the mosques that had formed. And they worked out that it was predominantly about 100,000 Muslims at that time in 1974. And it doesn't sound like a lot, especially when you come from a Muslim country, but here in Australia, back then, it would have been a lot. We also have something called census here in Australia, where we have to fill out every couple of years, you know, if we're Muslim, or we're practicing, and, and you know, how you're dwelling, and they get a lot of information. I'm not sure if they do this in Indonesia, but they do do this in Australia. So a lot of Muslims don't declare that they're Muslim for their own personal reasons. So um, the, 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 the census declares it about 50,000, whereas um, Mr. Katani believed that there was about 100,000 because he went to every state and spoke to the Muslims around then. So when he came back, he believed that um, at that moment, halal certification needs to be in Australia. Now, Halal slaughtering, actually, from, from Australia to Saudi Arabia, was actually occurring from the 1960s anyway. However, Saudi government was actually the ones that imposed that upon Australia, uh, that we should actually be signing a certificate. So it's actually not anyone from Australia, nor the Australian government, but it was Saudi that actually introduced that for us. So a lot of people are unaware of that. And so this got that decree came down in 1975. And they actually requested a whole lot of um, all those councils and all those mosques that they saw in Australia to start signing certificates that, you know, they could um, start auditing places and signing certificates. And a little bit later, they realised, you know, there's too many, too many certification bodies and they kind of made them say like there was 10 in one area, they would put them all under one umbrella, and this would be called, you know, another halal certification body. So they tried to have um, less certification bodies. So Saudi Arabia had a very big um, play in how 
um, how lots of education bodies formed in Australia. And in saying that, everything was going swimmingly well for the Muslims. Finally, at that moment, it, you can imagine back then, and I'm, I'm a 70s baby, I remember back then Muslims predominantly were just like, we'll make sure there's no pork and we'll make sure that there's no alcohol like beer or wine or things. And that way we know our food is halal. There was no formalised of technical knowledge of what we know today. Um, or it's not to say that there was no technical knowledge out there, but it was that this wasn't being, uh, you know, there was no practice of halal certification. Um, even though um, slaughtering was taking place, um, but, you know, once that goes to another place to be processed, this wasn't being looked into um, well until another 20 years in Australia. So everything's going swimmingly well. And then in 1982, Australia went through a huge issue. This was one of Australia's biggest challenges. It's what's called the meat substitution racket. This racket, went, it meant that uh, animals, so if you were uh, uh, an abattoir, that abattoir was supposed to be sending halal beef to a place and instead they might have been selling horse meat. They, they, you know, they were supplying horse meat. And this became huge because people weren't receiving the products that they were supposed to be receiving. And in some cases they were receiving inedible products. This corruption was so deep and the way it was found was because a Muslim a supervisor or Solomon went to the police and said, I don't think this meat, the what I'm signing for, I don't think this is halal. And so that's what exposed a huge issue in Australia. And you can imagine, um, and, and these are all in the court documents if you do want to have a, have a look at it in, in Australia and put in the meat substitution racket, it's very evident. It talks about that the corruption was not only at just the slaughter place, and I want to make it really clear, these slaughter places are non-Muslims. They have Muslims that are working there under the direction of the certifier. But at this stage, controls weren't in place. Corruption was even at the cleaning level. Corruption was even at, you know, we had the Australian government inspections coming in and they were getting paid off or they weren't, Things weren't in the place that they needed to be. And not only that, the abattoirs were actually placing the logo or they forged the logo or gained the ability to use the logo um, and they were stamping certificates without the certifier's knowledge. So inside the whole case, you can imagine that the judge has basically, he's, he's basically said there's not enough controls there is basically a huge issue and it, it was at a factory, like, you know, at a, at a, at a meat level, at the establishment level, but also the Australian government level and also on the certifier level. They believe that even the certifier, even though they know their religion, wasn't kind of aware of the capabilities that the meat works could hide information and this and that. So you can see the development here in Australia where the Australian government went, that's not going to happen anymore. And it's what was established the export control orders in 1982. This is how Australia, like there was regulations for meat way before this. But after this, Australia was, was like, this is our agriculture. This is our market. This is our industry. We need to take control of this. And this is where Australia now regulates red meat here in Australia. And it is amazing. Um, we'll get to the levels that it goes to, but it, it really, um, they have a website um, that promotes halal. It's called Australian Halal. They have a specific logo that is specifically Halal Australian um, and it goes on to meet. So these are many orders um, that came down and these orders come from the Australian federal government. So um, I do believe when this went down, um, Malaysia um, 
and probably other standards did change because they realised, oh gosh, we've been receiving imports of meat that weren't correct. So they also had to put controls back there. So you can see a change in standards that happened around that time. So down in the 1990s, um, we also had a um, huge, the, well, how food came about was um, the supermarket guide was created. And this was done by the owner of the company that we were. At this time, there was only meat slaughtermen, uh, certifiers, predominantly who were slaughtermen and became certifiers, here in Australia, that is. And a supermarket guide was developed and there was nothing like this before where that got published by the Australian Federation of Islamic Council and then this went out to the consumers and, and even tourists. And this changed the way halal certification was done in Australia specifically because now it was about food. Now Muslims were entering into food places and now we could actually see what's going on, how the process is. And I'm sure this happened in many other countries in different ways, but this is how it happened in Australia. In 2005, the export control orders were also changed. This is from the 82 orders. So you can see there was a major change. Malaysia and Indonesia ended up changing their standards. And so Australia then, well, we've got to follow these standards because they're huge markets for Australia and therefore the federal law changed here. When I talk about orders and law, it means if you do the wrong thing in halal with regards to red meat, you can be fined, you can lose your licence to even slaughter meat. So it's very serious here in Australia and there's specific standards and, and, and procedures that have to go through or an abattoir has to go through even to even get to the level that they want to even claim halal. So in 2005, also the Australian government went, okay, well, we're going to produce our standardised halal certificate for meat and basically we're going to sign it and then you're going to have your supervisor or slaughterman at your site and they're going to make sure that that batch of information is correct. And they're going to sign what's called an interim transfer certificate to say, 400 kilos of, you know, uh, red meat. This is what I saw slaughtered. They sign that. That comes to that that government certificate and that transfer certificate comes to the certifier, and then the certifier will dual signatory on that halal certificate of the Australian government. So that was instituted in 2005. Also in 2005, which I believe was the first of July was when um, they started the Halal Consultative Committee. This committee still runs today. It has, it runs twice a year and it has all the stakeholders of the industry, meaning every Halal certifier that's export worthy, every red meat abattoir. We have the Australian Meat Industry Council. We have the Australian Meat Livestock. We also have the Australian government and anyone else that's related. And it allows us to speak about this is what's going on in Indonesia, this is what's going on in Malaysia, this is what's going on in Saudi Arabia. And we all work together to find a way that's going to work. And obviously the certifiers say this is what we need. And this, and then the, the meat companies are like, oh, well, we can't do this. And we're like, we well, have to. <laughs> so there, there's this, this interaction that takes place. As you know, Australia, and I remind you, is a secular country, so they can't be involved in religious certification and they heavily rely on the approved export halal certifiers. And the approved export halal certifiers are listed on the Australian government. Just like in Indonesia, there's um, foreign body halal certifiers that, are accept, um, that they've approved of. Same with Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Singapore. So all these um, countries do list um, they're approved certifiers. So this is how it moved from a very informal, probably watching the backyard slaughter, halal certification, just make sure there's no whiskey or something inside our products to getting inside of the products 
uh, inside of the establishments and being able to see what went on. I believe this shows a very clear proof of how industries change and develop. In the next slide, I will show you that food, just like food safety certification, it's exactly the same. It didn't start off with the perfect food safety. There was meat. I know in Australia there was meat hanging outside in, in the butcher shops, flowing in the air, picking up the bacteria and the flies sitting on it. This is how it started. And then they realised, oh, people are getting sick from this. And then processes started to be put in place. So usually from a place of process, this is usually where we start to realise we've got to put controls in. Just like, again, I mentioned food safety, you might have a salmonella outbreak and they go, how did this occur? Well, what can we do to prevent this in the future? Halal certification was developed in the same way. Back then, um, I know in Australia, um, uh, we were actually eating ice cream, well, maybe unaware, but it wasn't until 1993 that we're discussing here where halal processed food began, that we, the realization that ice cream was holding those emulsifier 471s and 481s, which back then were porcine derived or pig derived. And so people unwillingly or unaware were eating things that actually were having items of haram. I can tell you the sugar, it was, it was um, refined with pork bones. I'm talking back then. Um, so you have these interesting changes that have taken place that when halal certification came about, and let me just digress one slightly bit. So we have in 1974 when meat slaughtered was established, but in 1993, food, processed food was in Australia was, was established. And in this process, we, that's, it, it's when we were going into these places, inspecting. Now, all of a sudden, the Muslim consumers have more knowledge, including the certifiers, have more knowledge of what is going on, how processes are done. But before that, it was very hidden. So, and it's not hidden on purpose, like someone was trying to hide it. It just wasn't within our view. And so now, today, I mean, with globalization, we have access to so much. If someone wants halal certification now, it, we're able to go and do it by a, a very clear system that's brought out about by Indonesia or Malaysia or Singapore or the Gulf. And like being in Australia, where we're a huge import, uh, sorry, export country, we've got to put all those standards together to make a standard that fits all the world. So. It's, it's, it's really amazing to see the changes here in Australia. And basically at that intervention in 1993, halal certification made a change for other industries. So you can imagine I was talking about the ice cream. You can imagine that the vegans and the vegetarians and the Jews were like, oops, oh my gosh, I'm also eating meat products that I didn't want to be eating. So it started to open up awareness into the industry that we didn't have. And of course there's, you know, vegan uh, certification and vegetarian certification and there's kosher certification. So, you know, none of these started with perfect uh, control systems in place. It usually started from awareness of entering into a new situation or a catastrophe happening and a new challenge to face to put control measures in. So let's get back to the grid. So with halal cleaning, imagine you've got all these processed plants and now we're looking at, hang on, well, we were already looking at the halal processed plants and we're looking at cleaning. Then more and more cleaning products and chemical products um, were coming onto the market that were halal certified. So this came about the following year in 1994. And in the following night, it, year, people, Muslims were now going, well, if I can eat food that's halal and my cleaning products are halal, what about the medicines and the product, the supplements that I'm putting into my body? So this began the 1995 boom for us for halal su supplements. And again, in 1999, um, cosmetics became um, prolific in Australia, toiletries and medicines. So it, it did take a little bit of a while before it became, you know, uh, from 1974 for our first 
halal certification to 1999, uh, sorry, to 2015, which is a big boom in pharmaceuticals. And this was actually brought about, well, as I say, what I should have said is, is from 1974 to today, it's, it's taken a lot. And you can see all these booms that have come about. Um, the reason why the pharmaceutical boom came about in 2015 was actually because of a, a, a standard that occurred in Saudi or in the Gulf, in the UAE. They put a, a new pharma pharmaceutical standard out and those companies that were already going in that were considered approved by the Saudi FDA um, um, were already getting, they were getting certified by the Saudi FDA. This is no longer, like that became a different process and that became that boom. So it's really interesting that standards all over the world, you can see it very clearly that it gets highly affected in Australia. One change to a standard will change it at a government level and a certification level. Uh, also in 2017, we saw the kombucha come about. I can tell you uh, I'm showing my age at 48 years old, but I remember 20 years ago or even more so, Kombucha used to be something that, you know, I remember seeing on TV that people would make it um, in their own um, homes. It's not to say that kombucha didn't exist before, but it became highly um, marketing. Like it was, it was huge in, in Australia. I'm unsure about the rest of the world, but it definitely is here in Australia. And it's now a normal product that's found on the shelves. With kombucha, I will talk about this at the end of our slides and just leave it at that for this moment. In 2018, we saw a huge veganism coming in. So it's not to say that vegans didn't exist before the boom happened, but all of a sudden it was like, okay, um, we want to be looked after for our dietary concerns. What are you doing about us? And then it became a boom for us as halal certifiers. So ve like they, a lot of companies were, were trying to produce for the vegans, and then they also wanted that to be halal certified. So here's just a snapshot of what um, has occurred over the last, oh gosh, forever, or for us it feels like forever, but it's probably the last 50 or so years. So why do like companies here in Australia, consider being halal certified for such a secular country. I can tell you still to this day that there are so many companies that go, oh, we don't even know what halal certification is. What is it? And I'll talk about that a little bit um, further in our slide, but I just want to plant a little seed in there. A quarter of the world's population is Muslim. Now, just a couple of years ago, it was a fifth of the world's population, but we're looking at 23.5% now. That's very close to 25. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a quarter of the world's population is Muslim. And that is one of the biggest markets in the world that you can com comply to. And I don't know why many more food countries aren't involved with it, but it would be a lot to do with people not even knowing what halal certification is. It's only when your buyer predominantly says, I want to be halal, you, I need you to be halal certified. Then a processing plant in Australia goes, oh, and they start to look for the halal certifier. Well, we'll also discuss that later. So Australia is an export country with 2.6 Muslims. This was the last census percentage that was found. It could be a little bit higher um, because a lot of Muslims don't uh, say that they're Muslim, but it wouldn't be that much higher. Um, I believe that there is, I think there's about 700,000 Muslims with 26 million people in Australia. So it's not a lot. Australia is surrounded by Muslim countries. So you can see all those little green parts are the Muslim countries. And you can see Australia is down in that right hand, bottom left hand corner. So we have got great shipment across that water practically going to almost every Muslim country. Our land in Australia is huge. I could say most of it's not even habitable. It's desert and agriculture and farms. And still to this day, I cannot work out where all our sheep come from and our beef for slaughtering to occur because our abattoirs slaughter 4,000 sheep a day. 
There's about 90 abattoirs that are halal certified for red meat in Australia. That's also including beef. And beef slaughter about 400 to 600 a day. And some smaller plants, maybe 300 a day. So you can imagine how big the place is agriculturally to produce that every single day. Personally, I go through these farms and I still don't know where all these sheep come from because um, I feel like there's so the land is so expansive. But we've also got a huge industrial um, landscape here in Australia. So it allows us as a Muslim that we actually have the highest amount of capabilities for eating halal food in a non-Muslim country. Because 70 to 80% of our supermarkets are halal. And we're lucky. And it's, just, it's, it's almost like we're running like a Muslim country, even though we're not anywhere near it, but we've got the access to the food. And by the way, the reason why companies are being halal certified in Australia is not to service, although they may want to service the, the domestic Muslims, it's predominantly because export requests it. And we just benefit from it. So we say thank you to the Muslim countries, especially Indonesia, because it's huge for Australia. So like I said to you, importers request halal. And this means like someone will call up and say, hey, I would love you to be halal certified. They'll say, I don't know anything about it. And they'll say, just look on Google and or they'll go contact your government or they'll they'll give a list of halal certifiers that they wish for, the, for you to be there. But, or, 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 you know, that are accessible into the country that they want it to get come to. And obviously country standards and fatwas have a, a whole lot of reasons why something needs to be halal certified because we want to follow our religion. So what are the benefits? We have the opportunity for Australian businesses to grow. It's so important for us for that to happen. And businesses are trying to be inclusive for dietary requirements. You saw the change that happened from Australia when we were really nothing to having those small booms and those changes. And even just even to the point of veganism where, you know, people are halal certified, uh, they're organic, they're kosher, and, you know, and they could be vegan. Very interesting that we're seeing include like huge inclusiveness now today. We have an increase in employment. We've got a very interesting situation in Australia. And to me, it blows my mind. We have, I believe, 17 or 18, I think it's 17 um, free trade agreements. And of those free trade agreements, one in five people are to do with that trade. Now, the trade has worked out to be for halal, 30% of that. So it's really, you can see, it is so important about halal in Australia. And you can see that you've got one in five employees involved in this trade. So you can imagine that people in Australia are working in the industry to promote halal or to facilitate halal products getting into other countries and not even realizing it to the level that they're doing it. Uh, and exporting reduces prices domestically for us. So if there are reduced um, exports, Australia's prices go up quite significantly. And believe it or not, actually, abattoirs send out their best meat to the Muslim countries and Australia doesn't get that highest quality. So you guys are getting our good meat and, and our meat in Australia is still fantastic. So we see these logos and these and these labels everywhere. And we're starting, as I said to you before, halal, oh, sorry, as I said to you before, we're seeing in the halal certification industry that you'll have a label and it will say halal, kosher, vegan, and organic. And you're seeing this inclusiveness. Halal is no different. I know as Muslims, we're like, we're not, we know, but you'll be so surprised that the non-Muslims will actually, they think it's this special thing that's going on. And it's, although we've got our processes and our practices, it's a certification system that, you know, follows a certain requirement to gain that certification. It is no different from any one of these certifications or claims, what we call in Australia, that someone is making. Um, and it's good, like the more I see of, um, you know, another certification like organic, we know that there's no alcohol and kosher, we know that there's no 
pork. So these things help us. And, you know, if you've got vegetarian, then you're going, okay, cool, we're not dealing with meat anymore. So it's it's quite helpful. And it, the more um, third parties, certificates that a client has, it's great. So I'm unsure if you're aware that we've now moved from 2000, um, I believe we, there was a small part that I didn't put in here, but uh, inside the what happened in 2014, but we saw major another major challenge happen in the industry. And it was a, a really sad one, to be honest with you. Um, but but it, it ended up being great. So it was what was called the anti-halal campaign. This campaign was brought about how um, a political party decided to go, ooh, let's focus on halal. Let's say that they're instituting Sharia in Australia. Let's get a whole lot of people that are not quite aware of what's going on and let's get them boycotting every single halal product here in Australia. And it had a huge impact. And we'd heard as certifiers many things before and we didn't, uh, you know, you kind of just go, okay, it'll calm down. But this one wasn't calming down. It was getting louder and louder. So we ended up suing them to, because the clients, because we were predominantly looking after the food clients. Um, and that's not to say by now and then that, that there's, a, there's food clients with other certifiers by now. But we had so many of them coming to us and they were going against every certifier, but we had enough evidence to go, okay, let's just use what they're doing for us and let's go against them. Now, we did win, and which was great. And with the knowledge of that win, Halal Food Australia Authority, sorry, Halal Food Authority in the UK also had the same situation occur with them with a huge anti-Halal campaign. And they also got the idea to sue them. And they also recently won as well. So this happened at this time that clients were going, okay, I'm not, I, I, I don't want to be boycotted, so I'll stop my lol certification. Or they would take the logos off the packages. And it became harder for local Muslims to be able to see what was halal and what was not halal. So in this time, we had clients actually standing up. We, 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 we um, you know, and they would have blood thrown out their factories and stuff by these people if they did stand up. But, you know, they were lucky enough that they had a great um, police um, people that actually, you know, took some of these people to court. Um, and I remember at that time our building was being threatened to be blown up if, if this was continued. Can you imagine that we're being the ones accused of terrorism, but they're the ones terrorising us? So it's really interesting, that mirror. And it happens all over the world. But what happened, what was really interesting is a lot of people and the, and the sensationalism that happened around that, a lot of people were starting to go, hang on a sec, what's halal? What's halal certification? Why aren't I in this? Because the ones that were actually starting to look into it, they were starting to educate themselves and a lot of factories and establishments became halal certified in that time. And we often see that so many times that when um, Muslims actually... Um, you know, like I, as, as I've got on this new uh, on this new screen, when events happen um, and they're quite a bit of a catastrophe, we have an influx of Muslim conversion. And in the case of the anti-halal campaign, we had an influx of halal certification. And although in the Gulf War um, and the anti-halal campaign's logos were removed, um, it still didn't stop certification growing and you saw a lot of conversions happening in 9-11 you've seen I, I don't know if people have been watching TikTok but it's become a lot more globally um you can see what's going on and so many people are converting it and telling them their stories and stuff like that just with the recent occupation in Palestine and again in New Zealand um a couple of years ago we had the Christchurch terrorist attack where um the guy went and shot all the Muslims in the mosque so this also led to Muslim conversions. So it would be really interesting if someone actually started researching into to that because um, although these catastrophes happen, there are huge benefits that happen for the Muslim Ummah um, in, in, in more conversions. Um, I also, um, every so often I'm going to stop with some academic ideas because as a halal certifier, I 
We'd like to see more of this information come out and more people doing, um, uh, we see a lot of um, academics from Muslim countries write about um, uh, qualitative research, but it would be really good to see. Um, we also see quantitative research in Muslim countries, but it would be really good to see it um, in, in non-Muslim countries. So um, that, that would be awesome. Um, but we do want to see a little bit more quantitative research in, in the halal certification industry. Um, and not to mention, how does the halal logo, logo even affect non-Muslim consumers? We'll come back to other academic ideas as we progress through this talk. So what is Indonesia to Australia? What's the market like and what's the trade like? Well, Indonesia to us is expected to be the 2000, in 2030 to be the fifth largest economy in the world. That's their, that's their expectation. And I believe that is exactly what's going to happen. To Australia, Indonesia is the 14th largest trading partner. So they have a two-way trading agreement, oh, sorry, two-way trade of 18 billion, approximately. In 2021, wheat were being exported to Indonesia was 1.38 billion. And that was the highest export. Actually, over the last 26 years, exports to Indonesia from Australia has increased by 5.58%. And it's just continuing. In 2014, $34.4 million in pharmaceuticals was exported. In, two, in 2021 and 22 financial year, 1.1 million of meat and livestock to us, Indonesia from Australia, sorry, 1.1 billion. Um, and it's 7%, which is 7% of Australia's exports. Um, and I'll, I'll get to what the Australian halal oil industry is worth. But if for Indonesia, 63% of just an example of beef offal is imported into Indonesia and comes from Australia. So let's look at another market, Malaysia. It imports about 30% of its food. The US supplies approximately 17% of that and Australia approximately supplies 10% of that. New Zealand dominates the supply of liquid milk in Malaysia and Australia has the leading market share position in cheese, yogurt and butter calories. Um, Southeast Asia for dairy from Australia is huge. It's where the, it, it's a huge market, not to mention meat. So looking at Southeast Asia imports, Malaysia is 62%, Singapore is 88% and Indonesia is 98%. So you can see for a country like Australia that produces a lot of agriculture, it's really important for us to have that market in Indonesia as well. Um, I did speak about the gold standards, about the pharmaceutical, and it changed how things were in Australia. I also want to admit that at that time in 2015, it actually um, introduced other standards and it increased approximately almost 20 to 30% more imports of halal certified goods into the Gulf from that 2015 uh, movement of changing standards. So it's not as if there wasn't standards there, but it became more um, promoted that this is what our expectation is. Don't let any product that doesn't meet this requirement. So the certifiers, you know, when companies want to be certified, they come to the certifier and then the certifier is instituting those standards. So that when their competitor is getting halal certified, the other person also wants to get halal certified. Um, so it, it became quite a quite an, a boom, not just in pharmaceuticals. The Gulf has no agriculture. It actually imports seventy percent of its goods and then re-exports fifty percent. So it might import it into the UAE and then export it to uh, to to Bahrain or something. So that's how they work. It's one of the largest importers of cheese. Um, it has a huge tourism growing market. It's not to say that other Muslim um, markets are not growing in the same way because they are, but this is specifically um, for the Gulf. It has a large trade show known as the Gulf Food Expo, which I believe is happening right now. Um, and it's got a 7% annual growth rate. So 
what does Australia look like for increasing of halal certification? So one of our triumphs is that we're still increasing about 10 to 20 percent every year. Um, predominantly down that east coast, it is probably doing about 10 to 20 percent. I know in South Australia they had declared that it was approximately 800 million, so you can see that's a lot lower. So what's it worth to us? These are our huge triumphs. The total halal market in the world is around 2.1 trillion US dollars. In food, Australia has 13 billion per year, and in meat, um, in 1718 it was 12.8. This was approximate, so food would be about 30%, meat is about 25%. These markets today are sitting at um, four, uh, 15 billion um, for food and 14.5 billion for meat. So you can see that it's sitting at about 29 and a half billion, which is about 30 billion in, in food for, and meat for Australia. So that is huge. And you can see that it sits at approximately one's a third and one's a quarter of the industry. So halal, halal products and halal certified goods are so important to Australia. We do about 140 million on live um, exports. Um, our um, our uh, GDP is 1.6% of the global market which makes us the 12th largest economy. Now, this is our biggest triumph. And I can tell you right now, I see so many times people quote Australia and their percentages, and they are completely wrong because they're getting their information from the wrong place. The Australian government has really clear, like we have industry councils that gather all of our information and our exports, and we are aware of what's leaving and what's going in. We're actually number one in lamb and goat export. We're number two in beef export and we're number four in food and beverage export. From, from starting from nothing and slaughtering in your backyard, we've become a top producer. So as a Muslim in Australia, we have access to a great range of um, red meat and food and beverages in Australia to eat from. But this is predominantly getting also marketed out and exported to overseas countries. So it's a bit exciting for us. So let's look at some um, success stories. I don't, I, I know this our product does go actually to Indonesia. It's known as Bega Cheese. Um, when they started out before halal certification, they were worth 100 million and they had 100 workers. Today, they have halal certification, they're worth 1.5 4 billion with 2,000 workers. Bigger Cheese has not only just gone and they had their own factories that they were dealing with their cheese products, they've just gone and bought a whole lot of um, dairy um, factories also for milk, which is, they're just huge now here in Australia. So that's, it's, it's, it's amazing. So they're exporting about 442 million. So another success story, this company called Dollar Sweets, they increased 15, so in the year, financial year of 2022 and 23, um, the Australian government decided, because we've got a great government that supports trade, um, they actually, the dollar sweets were like, help. Australian government went, yep, what do you want us to help with? They were like, we want to increase. So they were like, get into halal certification. Actually, dollar sweets were actually halal certified for quite a long time, but they wanting to develop, they wanted to increase their halal market. And they did. In one year, they increased by 15%, which I believe I think was a million dollars. Um, or they had a, they ended up receiving in that year a million dollars worth of um, business, um, which led to even more. Um, so the recent way they actually started promoting because they were like, well, Muslims and Muslim women want to bake all over the world and they want to have cakes and stuff and they want to put these, uh, what they're called, parallels, I can't even say the word properly, but they're, they're called hundreds and thousands. But, um, you know, and, and they've become great. So it's another success story in Australia. Um, just before we get into domestic and export, I also wanted to discuss um, how the Australian, oh, sorry, I've just lost it. Please forgive me. Um, it'll come back to me. 
Um, the I'll let it go. <laughs> it's not coming back to me. So um, let's get into changing the way we're looking at this um, lecture or this talk today. Before now, we've just talked about the developments, what led us on a down a downfall, and what led us on a on, on a triumph. Because of those standards and those federal laws, it's just become so so great for us in Australia to have such mechanisms for us. Uh, I knew what I was going to say. Um, with kosher, um, another way, another industry affected our industry is we see in cheese that there's a lot of, um, you know, you call animal, animal rennet. So we want this to be halal certified, of course. And the kosher industry actually were like, we don't accept animal rennet. We want, um, obviously, halal certified rennet. They were like, we want microbial rennet. And so, of course, we need this to be halal certified, the microbial rennet. So the industry in Australia has predominantly changed to microbial rennet now that's found in cheese. So it's interesting how different certification um, are into, into like uh, having an effect on another certification. But I just wanted to say that before we try to totally change a uh, perspective and move into what does this mean? How are we actually providing certification here in Australia? So we actually have 27 licensed export halal certifiers. Licensed means the Australian federal government has approved these certifiers. And these certifiers means that they can do red meat or they can produce, they can certify for meat in Australia. If you are not on that list, you cannot um, do meat. It's not to say that you can't do food, but um, the meat, the list that's on the Australian government website is predominantly to make sure those ones are licensed, they've been audited to the standard. Now, with the Australian government, not only when they come to audit us, do they audit us to the federal government requirements and the meat requirements, they're also going, well, Malaysia requires this, Indonesia requires this, and they're also holding us to that standard as well. And these reports are also sent to governments when they do their audits. Also in Australia, that's not to say that um, the Muslim governments also come to audit us in Australia, Australia as well, as, as other countries they, they do. Um, in Australia, we have what's called domestic certifiers. This could be a mosque, uh, a local mosque that could just go, okay, we're, we've, got a, we've got a town in the middle of nowhere, it's five hours out of Sydney, and they, they just tend to just maybe locally certify something that's down the strip of shops or they might do that area. So this is what's called a domestic certifier in Australia. Um, usually these certifiers predominantly look after food service, retail, butchers, things that are staying here in Australia and not exporting. And worldwide, believe it or not, um, when I talk about uh, halal certifiers, I'm talking about foreign certifiers to us in Australia. I know in Indonesia, um, and, and in Malaysia, like you've got what's LPH, just like these inspection bodies, um, and, and the main person was MUI, now it's BP, JPH. Um, you also have, um, for us, that's considered the main certifier. So, so JACIM, MUI, MUIS, um, these were the considered one certifiers to, to us when they're counting this. So um, there are about 150 licensed export halal certifiers. This means those that have been approved to Muslim governments. So say it's Indonesia, Singapore, uh, the Gulf. So believe it or not, there's not actually a lot. And predominantly, um, although the Gulf Food Expo is huge, the Malaysian Halal Certifiers Forum is the biggest for us in, in the world because predominantly it's the one that brings all the certifiers in. And I do believe Indonesia does the same because we just came back from there in November. So it's, it's really interesting. It's where we all get together and we discuss ideas and all they will hold a conference and they'll tell us what's changing. So, um, and, and believe it or not, Hello Certifiers, we're all joined in the world by WhatsApp. So here's social media joining us all. It was very different um, before. So government approval means export Hello Certifiers are audited by governments for the country license. Hello Certifiers follow their standards. The standards are considered like regulations, laws, resolutions, um, and the certificates are issued are fatwas or an edict or an opinion. 
And each of those governments predominantly will have a list of the certifiers that they have approved. So this is what um, happens, and not to mention, as I said to you before, Muslim governments come out to audit us as halal certifiers annually or every second year. Um, now, in Australia, the way a client finds a halal certifier is the government will refer or they'll go on the government website. They could be referred by a, 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 you know, an existing client of their um, uh, certifier. And we have what's called a pre-existing client, meaning, yes, I want to be certified. I have a tender. I am producing this amount of products. I want to be halal certified. Once that's over, I, I don't wish to be halal certified. Of course, as a certifier, we hope that they be so continue to be certified so that the product continues to meet the requirements for Muslims and we've got more variety. Um, but unfortunately, there are some clients that um, don't continue to be and then they'll get another tender um, or a buyer overseas and then they'll start then. Um, so this is what's called a pre-existing client. They come back to you. Um, and also there's Google, internet and social media. And of course, there's word of mouth. I know for me as a certifier, the word of mouth and the government referral and client referral are our biggest um, ways that, you know, clients come in to um, contact a certifier. But believe it or not, you have all these certifiers, but even though the standards, like the standards are exactly the same, it doesn't mean that there's differences, there's no differences in the certifier. And this is all over the world. But specifically in Australia, I can tell you these are the, these are the main things. So reputation is a huge thing. A client may choose the reputation of a certifier to be halal certified over the market access. Um, I know, um, especially when there's a company that's huge and there's, I'm talking about major household brands that are all over the world, will definitely choose reputations uh, over that. Um, and I have been, so, I have witnessed that with my own self, um, that they, they, they are like, um, we don't want you to be in this market because this, if, or, or, because we want to stay with you and it's reputation to us. So it's really interesting to start to see um, that come about. Um, there's also um, me having to sign uh, terrorism contracts and stuff like that. Oh, what is that called? Anti-bribery. Sorry, not terrorism. Um, so that comes into that reputation um, thing as well. Service is another thing that is so important. Um, a lot of cert certifiers are might be reduced in price, uh, might be in the right location, and they don't really give the service. They might just produce, the, they're not saying that they don't produce the service in the fact that they're issuing halal certificates, but it's not the main thing of their certification body. Customer service isn't the big thing for them. They're just more predominantly just providing a service. Yes, we're here. Here's your certificate. Thanks very much. Do this, do that. Um, whereas you've got other certification body where customers um, everything and what I mean by that it doesn't mean you drop your standards it means that you um, respond to them quickly you give them the information that they require you don't sit on it um, so you know sometimes um, this is really important to a client especially in the flavor industry they need certificates daily location is important some countries have um, an establishment must, a certifier must be auditing in the same location as what the factory or the establishment is. So location can be important. Which country license the certifier has, what niche scopes they have. So these niche scopes means this. In all the countries, and I know Indonesia's increased their niche scopes hugely. So before they used to have three. Um, uh, flavors, meat, and food. Now it's huge. It's not to say that they weren't certifying heaps of other products. They were, but to a certifier, we would be if we were approved to all three, we could pretty much do all markets. Now it's changed. You might you've got to have several different scopes to get into different to, to be certified. And the same thing happens in other countries. So there's many different scopes now. So you might be a juice company and now you've got to find a certifier that can actually certify you for juice. Another thing is if you're speaking Bahasa and your certifier speaks Bahasa, they might find it easier and you've got that nice, nice uh, uh, thing or Arabic or whatever it is 
they, they might just find it easier. And of course, price. Price is sometimes what governs everything. I can say um, if you provide a service, the client usually doesn't care about the pricing. Um, but if you've got a client that cares about pricing, um, they just want the lowest price possible to get the most out of anything. And that, that's business, I guess. So let's go through the application and review stage. Don't worry, I won't go too much into it, but it's just explaining to you how it's certified and manoeuvres in Australia. I'm going to speak to you uh, predominantly what we, we what we all do is we receive and if we, we don't go out there are some people there are some new certifiers that may cold call um, predominantly that's not the way it's done the client will actually call you by email or phone and say hey we need our law certification they complete this manually or they complete this electronically most of the certifiers are still in a manual situation um, and they will uh, someone will review that application and this person has to be degree qualified this is the requirement now, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, this person would be knowledgeable in the area, but the more people that are, have to be in the whole uh, bodies or the certifiers must be degree qualified. Now, this is a requirement by the governments. So you have the establishment name, an address that's on your application form. You'll ask how many staff they have, how many production lines they have. We want to make sure that there's no fork on premises. Um, we want to make sure they're not on manufacturing, say, beer or something on the, on the lines and stuff. And could that, because that would lead to rejecting the application. And which countries they're exporting to, because countries is really important. If we don't have the country, we need to pass the client on. So that at the application stage, we can get rid of clients. I don't mean that in a bad way, but it just means we may not meet their needs or they might not meet our requirements. So we will pass that on to a certifier that can meet that requirement. Um, not to reduce in uh, um, Islamic requirements, but you know, say a market requirement or a scope requirement. So if they say we've got it approved and they said yes, and you've looked at the products and the ingredients and the whole certificates that they've uh, applied, you'll find that the, um, you know, you'll say, here's our terms and greens, uh, conditions, these are the fees, if they accept, they'll move through to this auditing stage. Uh, worldwide, halal certification requires two auditors, one Islamic, one technical. So food science, biomedical science, pharmaceutical science, as long as someone that's studied in Islam. So you'll have those two people going out all the time and um, auditing um, and um, they will complete a checklist uh, matching the standards that are required for that export of that product. Um, this checklist will be include a factory inspection, including an administration assessment, which usually is done at the factory. The really cool areas that are looked at is if you look at procedurally, you have a management team. You want a halal policy. This halal policy is so important because if you don't have that, it's, it's usually a public document and it, usually it's at reception. And it allows people that are coming into the site, hey, we're halal certified. We promise to make sure that we keep it halal throughout the chain, from inwards to outwards. We're promising to have um, raw material storage, uh, you know, sorry, raw material procurement to be halal. And they can, and then they want to continuously improve. So this is really important. This document. The next is obviously all the procedures that go place. It's so often that I, we, we see in halal certification that the practice is perfect, but it's not written down. And when a new person comes in and they want to um, learn what they're supposed to do, they may not know anything about halal certification. If what's not written down correctly, this new person could change the practice of what's being done. So it's really important that the practice and the theoretical matches or the procedure matches the practice. So it is important that this management team or halal management team also assesses risks for the entire factory. Now this is done for food safety already. So when you get a new client and they're going, oh gosh, I've got to assess it for halal, uh, sometimes the food safety requirements will say you've already got the templates, make sure that you're looking at the risk side. And some of those risk sides are one, making sure that you're getting halal certified goods Two, your raw material storage let's say you've got a, a flour mill well we're going to be looking at the insects what are you doing are you making sure you get rid of them 
are you fumigating? Like, so there are many interesting um, areas that we look at in each, in, in each niche. So it's very important that the client actually um, involves themselves in this, and it is a requirement, especially in Southeast Asia um, standards. Um, and it's sad sometimes because this is the hardest part we've got to push clients because I don't know if they just, um, they, they're doing the right practice, but it's an area that's, um, we try to develop every year upon the client because I can't explain it to you. You've got other clients that will go, bang, yeah, look at this. This is a 50-page risk, risk management table that we've done, and it's fantastic. And the other ones, we have to really build and get them to open their eyes up. Even though they've got a full food safety, it's, it's about trying to explain to them what it's required for halal. Training. Annual training for halal is required. Um, and internal audits of their entire system, not only halal, but the rest of their systems. Now, often you find when there's a situation that's not occurring properly, it's because the internal audit is not uh, addressing this issue. So um, this is also important. The reason why management reviews are so important as well is guess where the decisions are made? They're made at management. They are made in the management boardroom when they're having this meeting. And this meeting is usually done annually. It can be done monthly, but predominantly the big one is annual. And the decisions that you want manage you want hello mentioned at management level because if the, the managers are not mentioning it and they're not making decisions at that level you're, you're, you're having a, 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 an establishment that's not probably um looking after halal as much as you want to well, their ingredients might be halal they're producing perfect hello but you, you you want um you want the systems behind to have an incredible incredible controls in place so that's our job as certifiers to say this is the uh, sorry auditors to say this is the gap this is this what needs to be done and we're continually improving our clients to a, to another level e each time and obviously they do the base of what's you know considered making sure that they're not contaminating of, of course they're not contaminating but i'm saying everything can always be improved upon and being even better from the year before and even better from the year before even procedurally so some critical points from a factory perspective, everything from inwards to outwards is so important. The raw material storage and the finished goods storage are extremely important. We want to know, one, how are these products entering into our factory? Are there pork on these transport companies? Because you know transport, they go and pick up your goods and they go to the company down the road and pick up their goods and then they, then they go off somewhere else. So we've got to make sure that that truck is not carrying any haram contaminants, even though there's plastic wrappings and all sorts of things going on in these products, we still don't want any of the haram items on these um, transport. And being in a non-Muslim country, uh, this was, um, uh, you know, an area that needs to be looked at and, it, and, it, and it's so important. Uh, raw material storage, so we're just making sure that everything's um, separated. Some clients might have um, halal goods and they might have non-halal goods. When I say non-halal goods, these aren't haram items. These are things like, you might have a beef that's not slaughtered halal and they have two lines and they run this for this one and they run maybe, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know, food processing on another one that's completely halal. So it's often that they'll have more than one line and usually if they only have one line, it will be completely halal. But predominantly, we aim in Australia to make sure that the site is completely all their products are halal certified, all their raw materials are halal certified. Um, obviously, if you've got your raw materials down pat, your production's easy because in Australia and all over the world, whatever your approved supplier program is, you can't get products outside that approved supplier program. So the only thing that can be affected in production, um, it, well, it's not to say the only one because if you had poor management of your raw material storage and you were buying off, not off your approved supply program, then you've got an issue. But your production, you're looking at what's can, what what is the food touching? What's the equipment? You know, is it the equipment? This has got to be halal. If it's um, cleaning products that are in contact with that, this also needs to be halal. Your testing obviously is done. Um, uh, being an export halal certified, we also do testing. Not only the site does it, we also do porcine DNA testing, swabbing, and we do ethanol testing just to make sure that the products uh, it's an, an extra control measure to make sure that 
Muslim governments are receiving halal goods. Even though um, we can have a muesli bar, which you think has just got grades and stuff, we'll still do a test um, just to make sure. So of course our packaging, um, a lot of people come to me and they're like, what the hell, what's going on with packaging? I don't understand, it's just box, boxes and plastic. Like you'll be surprised that um, those boxes can have wax on it and that wax is made of animal fats. Um, I know back in the day, apples, you know how they look really shiny? Um, that used to be animal fats. They used to make it all shiny with animal fats. So um, things like raisins and, and stuff like that can be done with animal fats as well that make them, you know. Um, so uh, another one is making biscuits. It's not in the ingredients, but they'll put it on a, 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 a tray um, that's going in through the ovens and it's got animal fat on it. Um, obviously not in the halal certified plants, but they've got animal fats on it. And these aren't to do with the ingredients that are placed on the label. So that biscuit is being cooked on animal fat and on the label, it's just got the ingredients of what's in the, in the, the cookies. So there are many facets to, um, that are called manufacturing aids or processing aids that are not disclosed on the label and not disclosed to the Muslim consumer, but uh, you know, a certifier's job is to look for. Um, of course, pest control, we don't want insects in our food. Um, and obviously this is a food safety issue. Finished good storage, we want that separation. Um, making sure that it's only the halal certified goods that are, that are um, segregated from anything else. Obviously, like I said, no pork on site can be done at all. And the outward transport has to be the same as the inward. There can't be any pork on that transport. Even, you know, obviously it's not being picked up from you that it has pork, but is it going somewhere else? Are you predominantly the only truck that's going straight to the freight? Is this the truck that you will always use? There are many control measures that we go through. So the difference in meat that we have with our critical areas, and I won't go too much into this. The transport of stock um, in Australia can happen at about three o'clock in the morning. It can also happen at three o'clock in the afternoon. If this stock has been um, going around for um more than 12 hours that you know they would have to get out um at, once they reach that abattoir they have to be fed and they have to be watered of course they've got the capability of doing that on the trucks as well but um the truck you know they might have water but they won't have feed so you you don't want that truck going any more um than what the animal can handle and that's our job as a certifier to look at the welfare of that animal how much space they've got in those trucks, um, how far they're traveling, are you expecting them to go straight into slaughter? So usually the abattoirs will be out in the middle of nowhere and they're feeding on animal, um, you know, grass. And in Australia, they, they're, they're fed on grass in Australia. So um, another thing in Australia that's very, all the vets on the abattoir are registered where they're with the Australian federal government. So you'll see an Australian government emblem. They're there all the time trying to, to make sure that they're meeting the um, federal government export control orders, which is now an act and it's now considered the export control um, rules 2021. So it has changed from 82 to 2005 to the new one in 2020 and 2021. So Vet welfare, it looks to make sure that the animal is okay, making sure there's no cancers, no dog bites, um, and that's their job. And they'll give each one a number and they can only put healthy ones through. We won't go through the the, the main thing of it, but obviously it's got to meet the stun parameters. Um, in a Muslim country, you're much luckier than us. In Australia and New Zealand, it is a requirement in Australia. You cannot slaughter without reversible, non-penetrative stun um, for lull. So it means I've seen many animals get up off the slaughter or slaughter line after they've been stunned and they run off into the paddock or they run into the into the factory floor. So it's quite an interesting sight. Um, uh, so it is definitely reversible because I've seen it many times. Um, and of course, they slaughter the four organs that are required. So I won't go too much into that. Once that has actually occurred um, and you've gone and see the audits, whether meat or food or another industry scope, um, that's the, the checklist from the auditors will come to a panel and that panel, all of them are Drew Agree qualified, just like the auditors, just like the reviewers. And, um, I believe there needs to be two Sharia 
minimum and one technical uh, minimum. Um, and of course, one of those needs to be a signatory. A signatory cannot be uh, auditing. And any of these panel members cannot be auditing so that there's an impartial uh, conclusion made. And it has to be unanimous between the whole panel. If there's one of them, then it's it's not considered to be certified. Sorry, I just lost my voice. Um, so obviously at that stage, we can actually ask more questions to the auditors or to the clients because we might go, mm, I don't agree or we need more information. Um, we might ask for more documents and then we'll reject or we'll accept. So at the certification stage, the client will actually receive that report from the panel. They have a, a month, one month to complete their non-conformances. Um, if, and that's just on average, every certified might be slightly different. Um, I know for myself, I make them send me a plan within two days of receiving the report and, and within um, a calendar month, they have to submit the evidence. If it's a critical issue, it had to be solved immediately. With certification fees, um, the way it's to, to gain certification, the way it is, you basically pay fees, you close the non-conformances, you sign an agreement, we'll issue the certificate. So as long as those gaps are closed and you've met the requirement, your certificate will be issued. Um, and usually in our industry in Australia is that it is surveilled one to four audits a year. So if it's food, it will be once a year. If it's high critical area, it could be more than once a year. But in meat, it is federal law to, to audit four times a year. In Australian government, will get us into trouble if we go more than three months. So that's us. So some little academic ideas in between um, where I know for myself or as a, as a certifier, which I would like to see more um, research ideas in, is that manufacturers, what are the reasons for picking a certain halal certifier? Um, it would be really good to do that from a non-Muslim country. Um, because the main aim is um, a, a lot of consumers and buyers aren't aware of halal certification, even though it's su such a big industry. Uh, why aren't more hotels, and, and I, I know from a Muslim country it doesn't seem feasible, but from a non-Muslim country it does. Why aren't more hotels halal certified in non-Muslim countries where huge Muslim tourism is prevalent? How certifiers can protect their certificate of transferring to another establishment, such as a wholesaler, when the Muslim consumer doesn't know any better? Halal certification in non-food sectors, um, such as, you know, plastic bags, all sorts of different things, because um, I know a lot of clients that require the, the plastic bag to be certified um, because of the products that they're going to because their buyers require it. Um, cultural factors influence consumer perceptions of halal certified product. So um, there can also be uh, investigating the role of halal certification in reducing food waste along the supply chain. I know one in all our audits, this is something we look at. Um, we we ask about the wastage, we and they have to show proof that they're reducing that down. So it's important because we, as Muslims, we don't like to waste. Uh, a lot of the weaknesses inside the global industry for a halal certifier is yes, we haven't got that harmonised standard. But there's some exciting news. In Malaysia last year, we saw all the countries um, there um, at the, the forum. Um, and, you know, um, it was so interesting that we're seeing now governments, it's not about the MOUs, but they're actually saying, we're going to see how we can join the standards um, or there'll be something between them. So this has never happened. It's not to say that there hasn't been um, each country puts out their standard that they want, but we've never seen that occur in a, in a halal forum. So, look, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it's nice to see that industry changing. And it's probably looking at, well, we hope as a halal certifier that, you know, if you're, you're, you're certified and audited and you have a license to Indonesia, that that would automatically gain you into other countries. So that's what that aim is like whether that actually happens um, that's what they're talking about but it'd be it's, it's great for us as a certifier um, another weakness is the distributors and the brand owners there's misuse of certificates and this happens all over the world the manufacturer will um they will they'll produce products for a brand owner so that they, they might produce for many brands um, so this manufacturer will be halal certified, but 
but then there's a misuse that this to, this um, manufacturer gives the certificate to all the brand owners going, here, your products are certified. But what people are unaware of um, is that that label and the packaging are owned by the brand owner. So they are really needing certification in their own name. And I know there are ports, especially in Southeast Asia, that actually go, no, sorry, it, you you need to have a certificate in your own name. But this it, it's still not being governed as well as it should be. Um, and it puts um, the certifier in a, in a, in a risky situation because there's always a misuse of um, the logo. Um, it's not to say that the product's not certified, but there's just, you know, you haven't got the rights to use this logo because that logo needs to be signed by the, the, the person that we've given the certificate to. So if we've given the certificate to our client, we're not giving it to a third party. So we would require a signature from a third party so that they're following our rules. Um, a transport and logistics centres. Now, I'm not talking about transport just to the trucks. I'm talking about when you get to the distribution centre at the freight forwarders before it's going off. Um, they have access to information. They would have transport documents, certification documents, um, you know, tr um, health certificates, all sorts of things before they're going to import into a specific country. Because not only that, that country will have information that they also need. So there'll be additional stuff that beyond a certifier. These people have the ability to monitor logos that they, if, you know, if they're claiming on their products that they're halal and there's no certificate to to back it up, that could be a stop. Um, I'm not just talking about my products, I'm talking about anyone's products. So there's that capability that hasn't um, uh, been developed at that stage yet. And I'm not talking about distribution centres or transport companies. I'm talking about the part where it gets to the logistics, just at the freight forwarders. There's a lot of stuff that can happen there that could be stopped. Um, so uh, the dissolution of Australia and Muslim consumers. There's a lot of just like in Australia being a non-Muslim country where there's a dis there's discrimination, there's Islamophobia, there's leadings to feeling of marginalization. We have stereotyping, so um, we can feel misunderstood and unfairly judged. Uh, when there's political climates, it can change the course that can impact it directly or indirectly, um, including international events. So the, this can influence, influence people's perceptions and feelings. And there's misinformation. So that always perpetuates a mistrust. And misinformation is huge for us here in Australia, meaning like we're always, you know, there's, there's even from that anti-halal campaign, there's some there's some some ideology that you know halal certifies fund terrorism, um, that we're instituting Islamic law. So as I said to you before, I would speak about this a little bit later. I remember back in 2014, SBS, which is a TV channel, um, actually called and said, you know, we want to write about this tonight. And I said to them, you know, this is the situation, and it was really great because they ended up getting. Um, a uh, Austrac, which is our, um, they chase, they trace all the financial things that move in from accounts. So they issued a statement saying no halal certifiers involved in in terrorism, and the Australian Crime Commission also said no halal certifiers involved in 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 terrorism. So we had all these places actually standing up. Um, saying that you know this isn't true so it was it was a huge thing here in australia and it was affecting it at government level as well um there's also myths about us that we bless the food yes we make sure the intention you know bismillah i said before slaughter but we don't go into a cheese factor factory you know blessing the cheese saying bismillah Akbar. so you know there's these misinformations that um go around uh at the same time, there was stand overing that we stand over them like mafia style. This is non-Muslims thinking this, um, and it can sometimes affect. Like you've got to think that most of our industry that are clients are non-Muslim, um, and they believe only meat and Muslims can eat halal food. So it's just interesting that misinformation. So let's look um, before we close a little bit. Um, some Muslim myths. Um, one of them is the tape recording of um, chicken um, where, you know, they're slaughtering and you're saying bismillah Allah Akbar, bismillah Allah Akbar. And they, um, there's a myth that started and it was actually a certifier 
um, was looking after a chicken factory and the company wanted to, to uh, no longer be with this certifier and they changed the certifier. Unfortunately, um, maybe due to the, the immaturity of the other certifier, they had actually um, put, a, put a rumor around to say, oh, they're using tape recorders. And of course, this went through the Muslim community. And, um, you know, obviously they didn't know where it was originating from, but it was more out of probably a little bit of jealousy that the other client, the other certifier got the company, um, but they spread misinformation around. And I still hear this myth today, you know, 20 years later. So um, I even saw it in a standard once. So I, I think it's just entered into a new standard, I think, in the Gulf. Um, but it doesn't exist. So it is done by mouth and it always has been done by mouth. Okay, so butchers. This is another little weakness that we've got in Australia um, and in a, in a non-Muslim country is we get a certification from the abattoir. We make sure it's certified. But the butcher then goes, I want to get halal meat. And they will say, I don't have a halal certificate, but I'm buying halal meat. The consumer never looks at the halal certificate to the level of looking at the name and the address that, oh, this doesn't meet the butcher that I'm at, that the meat. When the abattoir and the butcher usually goes to a wholesaler that has pork on it. So this thing that we have is that the Muslim consumers, if they were making sure that this butcher was actually halal certified, you wouldn't have the problem with the middle the middleman, but very often the butcher obviously um, doesn't want to be halal certified because they feel, oh, I'm Muslim, I don't need to, but they don't realise, you know, they're getting it from here because they're not asking what's going on in there. There's a, there's so, I mean, that's just one thing. The butcher might be non-Muslim, he's not serving any pork at his butchery, but He's he's he doesn't realise that he's he's getting he contacts his wholesaler saying can I have a halal certificate the wholesaler goes to the abattoir and gets the halal certificate. The other thing obviously is haram haram names. Um, it's very often Muslim consumers. I mean we know about wine, um, not to have it and hot dogs. Um, you know, uh, where the hot dogs are actually a, a long piece of bread. Um, and it was done because of the sausage dog. It's named after that. But bacon and cheese balls, um, really interesting. Um, I've, I've seen Muslims eat this. Um, there's no bacon in it. Um, it's just called it by name, but they're not realising the hadith. There's probably a lack of education that they're not realising just because it has no bacon in it. The name is mimicking something that's not halal, so it's not accepted, acceptable. So unfortunately, um, you know, this is another thing. So I told you that I would come to kombucha. So it is accepted. I believe all the standards pretty much accepted. But here in Australia, the New South Wales government has does not regulate the half a percent alcohols that can start to rise in these products. And they have investigated that they found some at 2.3%, way beyond what we would accept for um, Muslims. Uh, it's not something like personally, I don't certify beverages, um, especially ones that are going to ferment in any way. But I always say, Muslim, like, I, I can't tell you how many Muslim consumers here in Australia eat, drink um, kombucha. But um, personally, because I'm aware of this report and I'm aware of the industry, um, you know, it's something that I just won't certify, but other certifiers will. But, I mean, there are control measures that you could put put in place, but it's something I stay away from. So I always say, you know, leave it to your personal opinion, whatever your heart says. Um, obviously, science has a long play to play, but some people just don't um, listen when I'm giving them the information or where to go to. So some academic I, uh, ideas are exploring the role of social media and online platforms in shaping consumer attitudes towards halal products, um, exploring the potential for halal certification to address food scarcity and distribution challenges, which we had in COVID. Um, so we we had um, clients couldn't get their ingredients. And if they're in a country and they're getting everything from, say, China, you know, that, that caused a problem because they couldn't get those products from China when they closed the ports. Um, assessing the impact of gender-sensitive certification on consumer perceptions and market dynamics. So, you know, um, Muslims may, um, you know, females may be, 
on their menses and they decide that they want to put makeup on or maybe just nail polish um, or nude nail polish or something like that. Um, and, you know, there's these gender differences. Um, investigating the influence on digital marketing strategies on perception and promotion of halal certified goods. So the urgency um, to wrap up um, and the demand in halal certification is there are export opportunities, open up new markets and trade opportunities. Consumer trust, halal certification builds trust among Muslim consumers. We're aware of halal practices that increase businesses, but they also have the urgency to obtain a certification so that they can meet those halal standards. On the other side, um, say you're, you, you're the buyer, you have regulatory requirements from the country, just like Indonesia and Malaysia, where they say, we need a halal certificate. These are the requirements for you importing. So they, they, want, to, they want to make sure you're doing the right thing to avoid any legal issues. Of course, it's a competitive advantage. If your competitor's got certification, it makes it makes others get um, halal certification as well or want to be halal. And of course, there's the cultural sensitivity. So in regions with diverse populations, business may recognise the importance of catering to culture and religious preferences, which is, happens a lot in Australia. We're one of the biggest multicultural countries. So to finish up, um, the opportunities are that we're growing Muslim populations there's increased consumer awareness, globalization and trade opportunities. There's diversification of products, increased halal tourism. There's technological advancements that are happening. You know, you can see AI happening. Um, and it's even thinking about getting to the point where you have a manual and you say, does this manual say this? So there's it's advancing at a very strong pace. Um, continual upgrades and amendments to current regulatory standards. And of course, our biggest um, opportunity is harmonization of standards. So thank you so much. MashaAllah. It was a very comprehensive presentation, such an informative and comprehensive presentation. Uh, there are so many changes in our Muslim country in halal promotion, eh, Sister Nadia. There are anti-halal campaigns, terrorist issues, Islamophobia issues, also many wrong myths, and so on. But in other side, there are success stories from Australia. Then, point from Nadia, Halal standards are all same, but the difference are in reputation, service, location, market, rest and language, pricing. In other side, there are evidence in Halal Business Australia. Before and after certification, there was an a sub increase in number of export and workers. Mashal. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, after we know about the comprehensive outlook of halal Australia, now it's time to have a discussion with our speaker. Okay. Uh, Okay, okay. Uh, we are glad, yeah. Uh, we already received one question, but yep. uh, from from we read the question. Uh, moderator will ask question first. Uh, while uh, we are waiting, uh, the the question from participant. Uh, oh. Nadia. First question, okay. Uh, the comment, uh, where, where I am see the expectation for participant in chat room, yeah. Okay, in chat room, okay. Uh, question first from, from moderator, uh, Nadia. Muslim friendly tourism receive a lot of, of attention globally. How about in Australia? 
and still related what are your advice to muslim consumer to find halal food especially to avoid many fake halal certification issues particularly in our traveling or as tourists sorry can you mention that again sorry i was looking okay. for the question at the same time sorry okay uh, i repeat um, yes. muslim friendly tourism receive yes. a lot of attention globally how about in australia uh and look okay yeah, oh sorry i i remember the rest of it <laughs> okay okay uh, you first you first uh, um i was just gonna say um our problem we do have here is there is a, a halal supermarket guy that is for um tourism um, that allows Muslims to go to the supermarkets and buy products that are halal certified. Mm -hmm. There are also lists of halal certified establishments. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this list is not as uh, accessible as what it used to be. Um, and we don't have um, uh, the access to the tourists aren't there. All the Muslims, and it would be really good if there was something like a website or something that actually showed all this. Um, and there are some places in Australia, some um, websites that actually say this product's halal, um, or this company's halal certified, like a Thai restaurant or something like that. But the problem with these ones, or they're saying they're halal, the problems with most of these um, websites are they're run by people not in the industry. And it's just someone outside of the industry and they often give um, information that's not correct. So really and truly, we're not developing this, this, this area, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, Nadia. We are going to second question. Uh, I read second question from Rahmat Fitriansa. Uh, what are the, the efforts to create halal awareness and maintain Sharia compliance for readers and how to create consumer who have halal awareness in Australia. Okay, um, with the breeding um, programs, this is an area I would love to be. Um, it's not so developed um, where a, a, a certifier can have access to this side. I have discussed works of this and it's um, there's a possibility of this maybe opening up, but mm -hmm. it requires someone to then say, we want to certify our area and that's the way we get in and then that's how it develops. But unfortunately, this is an area that it's not so much looked at in the breeding side and it's predominantly managed more from mm. the Australian federal government um meeting those and those animal welfare requirements that are required but i would love it if, if halal was involved in that side unfortunately at this stage it's not um and um not that it's in breach of anything but i wouldn't be you mean we don't know exactly what the practice is or um you know they, i know they've got animal welfare requirements but which we you know for us we would be looking at the torturing of the animal and making sure they're fed and which is what the Australian government would look at, and the animal welfare here, they do audit to that level, um, but it would be good to see that halal could get into that side. It's just not developed here in Australia, not really anywhere in the world, world well, for those that are exporting to those Muslim countries. And as for the second part of the question, um, <laughs> part of my, it's part of my research, the same thing is education has a lot to do with it. Um, I would say a lot of the information that a certifier or a government, um, such as uh, Jackim or um, US or something, have, they have these capabilities, um, sorry, they have all the knowledge. Um, back 30 years ago, the certifier was closer to the consumer, whereas now we're further away because we're closer to the government and what's required of us and those standards, and it's now a separation between the client, like say the consumer and the certifier now. So it would probably need to be way more education and a lot of public stuff that would need to be out there now 
um, whether that be on certified websites, government websites, pamphlets, education centres, universities. Um, it, it, it's definitely something that needs to be done. Because I see it in, in I see it in Europe being the same problem as Australia as well. Okay, uh, you mean uh, we need we uh, our stakeholder of halal we need more education training socialization yeah in processing maybe for consumers yeah. because I think they don't realize us that so they think oh we're we're not really doing the right thing but we are we're we're very serious and we're following the right requirements that the governments tell us to but and mm. they think it's still. You know, they just think, oh, here's a certificate, you give it to them, and it's not the case. Um, so I, even when we bring new auditors and they train, they're like, oh, my gosh, I didn't realise it was at this level. So, you know, it's it's it would be really good that they were aware um, of the process um, that actually yes. takes place. Yes, uh, net process. Oh, yeah, we are going to a second question. I invite uh, Sister Rafika. Uh, please, you read your, your own question. Rafika Fauzia Azhari. Mention your institution. Rafika, are you there? Okay. Okay, uh, I read Rafika question. Okay, big problem, signal problem. Okay, uh, the presentation was clearly good. Just need a little bit explanation about what challenges do food producer in Australia face in obtaining halal product certification, and what factors cause Australian society to require halal certification for food product. Thank you. Yeah, and you're saying was that with the was it for food production? Was that did I hear the word food production in that? Or could you show? Sorry. Yeah. yeah we'll just change the way I answer it. Okay, okay. Uh, it, maybe you know, there was a word in there I couldn't hear. Mm -hmm. Or do you want to say the question again and then I'll say it Okay, where okay. I was. okay, okay. Yeah. I repeat. I repeat. You you need yeah. I repeat? Okay. Uh what challenge is food producer in Australia first? What was that word? Food what? Production. Food producer, yeah. For, yeah, for production. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, for in food industry, maybe, yeah. Food yeah. industry. Mm -hmm. uh, that Australia face in obtaining, for obtaining halal product certification. That's it. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. So you're talking about the food establishments, what they need to do to gain uh, certification. Is that clear? Yes, uh, what challenge is uh, food industry have to, uh, to, to obtain to get to get halal certification in Australia? Uh, That's an excellent maybe, question. Yeah, uh, so far in Indonesia, many, many documented, many documented, many uh, long progress, uh, progress and governance. Uh, how yeah, about yeah. in Australia? Is civil society? Or no. clear navigation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. It 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 all depends on your 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 products, obviously your ingredients. But it's okay. the same okay. like Indonesia. It, it it can have a lot of documentation. Mm -hmm. Ooh, have I um, but um, I know for my uh, industry, like our um, certification body, we we tried to reduce the paperwork seventy percent down mm -hmm. lower. Mm -hmm. um, that allowed um, mm -hmm. them to put their products and ingredients in and their halal certificate. Because the problem that client has is they have to reapply every year to make sure that the products and ingredients, if they're doing it manually, this is an extensive process. So um, for me, the way I reduce that is to that they have same products and ingredients all the time and they just keep changing the halal certificate. So this makes it easier. So you're not producing all the products and ingredients to the person every single time with the halal certificates and the food specs and everything else. So, but another challenge is that we have in Australia that might be different is that 
a client will go want to go to many markets and not every certifier has all markets. So they have to get two certifiers or they might have to get three certifiers to get to the whole world. If uh, And this can be uh, expensive for a certifier, uh, sorry, for a client. So this is the main issue um, of, 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 of wanting to make sure that they can get into the market that they want. So this is an issue that we've had for a, a long time. It's starting to change because as the government start to change the way that they're doing things, it's changing the way the certification company. So we're finding more certifiers have more markets now, So which, which, which wasn't the case before. Okay, uh, you mean uh, in processing two, heading to user-friendly yeah, for, yes. for halal industry, yeah? Yes, heading yes. to user-friendly and improve, improve by improve. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay. Okay, uh, next question on behalf all participation uh, question. Uh, this is question. Uh, are you uh, your institution, Nadia? Are your institution an independent organization or a government organization? Um, in Australia, so I'm a private institution, uh, a private uh, company. Um, so in Australia, um, None of us can be government, um, and the I'm government. Sorry, are, particularly oh. your 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 bodies, your your private. Your ah. private. So we have to um, we have to. Our requirement is if we're private, we have to pay huge tax, and okay. we have to pay we have to pay charity so to, so that oh. we can meet the Muslim government uh, Muslim government requirements. Whereas the other bodies will be maybe charity. Um, and they don't have to pay the tax, but we like to show the government all our all our tax, whereas a charity is very different. Oh, so fifty 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 private organisations in Australia, fifty charity, but mine's private. Oh, okay, okay, private, but tax and charity, charity. Uh, running, yeah. Okay, okay, and then uh, next question. Uh, Indonesia is one of the largest partners in halal business with Australia, you said. What are your message to halal producers? Why should they do halal business in globalizing era and digital era right now? Muslims are the biggest market in the world to me. I, I feel like okay. we're a quarter of the world's mm -hmm. population. Oh, sorry, if I answered that correctly? Uh, I repeat. You need, I repeat. No, 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 no. I was just saying, am I heading down the right way? I was just saying the reason um, why someone would, uh, you'd want to, is because Muslims are a quarter of the world's population. It, it'd be silly not to enter into that um, industry mm. at all. Oh, okay, okay. And then, yeah, you said uh, many combined requirements in this halal certification. And industry need more providing training, socialization, and education. The question: How do you inform and support your client with understanding halal compliant requirements? Refer: uh, Australia is non-Muslim country. A great question. So personally, okay. uh, I um, we have written. Uh, manuals that are very specific for our clients and they mm -hmm. not only have the standard in it but the controls that are required to make that standard happen and when our auditors go out we're able to explain the reason why mm -hmm. um, which really assists because most of the time a non-Muslim um, person it doesn't understand why they just think you're pushing you just want this no the reason why is because we want this. Um, I also send out emails to our clients when there's been any changes to standard, and then I mm -hmm. let them know that this has been changed in this manual. Um, actually, we actually send continual emails to our clients so that they're kept abreast of everything, and we mm -hmm. have an open dialogue with our clients. I mean, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, being a certifier, it's like a 24-hour gig, 
So, um, you know, clients do call you and say, this is what's going on, um, or can I do this? So, yes, it, it's. I always say to our staff, um, even though we're in this business of certification, it's all Dawa because all of our clients are non-Muslim. So everything you do must be informative for them and clear to them. Um, so we like it that um, our biggest referring of clients is our client referrals because um, we're, you know, we try to make it easy to, stand, to understand and we like to make the process following um, the requirements for governments mm -hmm. but simplifying the process because they don't understand as much as what we do. So what I mean by simplify the process is we've put a website together um, and the back end that they can see and it's definitely way simpler um, than the processes that are going on at the moment. Um, but yes, th that's that's the answer to the question. Okay. Uh, so challenges. So challenges in this part, yeah, for your yeah. Uh, role in uh, Australia ecosystem halal business. And then uh, in other side, how about the non-Muslim in Australia? Are they interested in buying halal products, sister? It's a good question. This is my first, my my best answer to this. All of them are eating halal certified products, and they have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I think predominantly, most of the staple goods like dairy, cheese, milk, um, mm -hmm. sauces, and stuff like this in Australia are all. Their fridges will be full of halal goods, but they won't know that it's actually halal certified. So it, it's hard to get into the minds. I would love a research paper on this to see what their perspective is. Um, but uh, I think for the majority of Australians through that uh, anti-halal campaign, most of the Australians, uh, didn't they didn't mind if they were eating halal food. It was just this 1% right-wing people that were like making a loud voice. Um, in that time. Okay, okay, Nadia. Uh, we we have still have Salsa Villa Hasna Basira. Uh, please, Salsa Villa, read your own question directly. Yes, I, I can. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just. It is reflected in the brand reputation that obtains halal certification other ways. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. No problem. Uh, um, so, um, the... I'm curious. Sure yes. Yep. Okay, okay, I read, yeah? Okay, I, I, I read. Oh, oh yep, yeah, yeah. I'm curious I'm about how Australia measure the success or quality of halal certification in a product or company. Is it reflected in the brand reputation that often halal certification or in other ways? Um, the success in the quality would be based on the certifier making sure that the client has controls. Mm -hmm. So this is really important because a lot of auditors make the client meet the standard but the client not isn't necessarily has controls to keep that standard where you need it to be. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the standard for Australia is the Australian government and the certifiers are very um, big on putting those control measures in place for the sort of um, for the quality of that product to be where it is. It's interesting if you're asking about whether it's reflected on the brand reputation. It's a really good mm -hmm. question because. Most of the brand names that I know that I do have and the household names that are very big all over the world, they're the ones that are the best in maintaining halal certification. And it's because reputation means everything to them. And when they say, I want to do halal, they'll jump seven kilometers high to make sure that they're getting there. So the quality is way higher in those brands that I notice myself. It's not to say every country company in the world um, that has a brand is, is that, but I've noticed some predominantly, if I could say the best companies that are following things are those ones that have brands, that very high reputation of brand. But I do know a lot of companies that are not big household names and they're meeting the exact same um, process. But I would say on average, those brand names are the ones that are the better ones. Okay. 
Okay, uh, Sister Nadia and everyone. Uh, however, we need to end our discussion session due to limited time. Brother and sister, we have finally come to end part of this day uh, on this day three. Uh, but before I close the session, I would like to Nadia to give us some short closing remarks. Are there any final thoughts before we end today's session? Sister Nadia, please. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, it's it's often that we don't get to show, uh, you know, Australia is a lot more prolific in halal certification um, mm -hmm. than we're given credence for. But um, Indonesia is aware how big Australia is because of the halal certification. Um, but um, I would like to say thank you so much. Um, I have a lot of respect for Yasi University. I've also done a, a, a few courses with Yasi University. So um, I am now on the other end. So I really appreciate it. Um, and I wish every success to every person in this room. Um, and thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for the concise closing remarks. And Please allow me also to take some highlighted point from today's session. Summary from moderator. A product is considered halal if it passes inspection for key elements. This element include the manufacturing process, facility audit, ingredient origins, whether they, they come from a halal source, raw material and finished product storage and segregation among other. How certifier should be familiar with the latest international standards and properly understand the technical and religious criteria that govern halal food production. A valid certification would only be possible with a thorough documented understanding of this issue. Brother and sister, from Nadia, from Australia Halal Success Story, there is there are evidences before and after the certification, export, the number of export and the number of workers increased sharply. And the global halal economy, uh, we uh, uh we know uh, can enhancing uh the global economic for recovery sustainability and excellence inshallah thank you very much sister nadia for addressing this interesting topic and your valuable contribution thank you for sharing your experiences with us today and also being here with us today, it is truly inspiring for all of us. And we are always so pleased to receive and hear about the person behind the halal industry, particularly the one in charge of certification by this. And today it's more special to have a lady in our webinar. Of course, and thank you to everyone, dear participant, my broad participant. We hope everyone has a good time and learn something new. We so appreciate your being with us today for all of you. Finally, jika ada sumur di ladang, boleh kita menumpang mandi. Jika ada umurku panjang, Boleh dong, kita jumpa lagi. Cakep. Cakep. Nadia, have you heard this rhyme before? No. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, yeah, please don't. I, I, I love like, it. Yeah, I make you curious. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Let me tell you the meaning this rhyme. If there is a well in the field, may we take a bath? If there is a life, 
May we meet again. Cakep. Oh, Masya Allah. <laughs> Clear lah dia. Thank you. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Wabillahi taufik wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Jazakumullah khairan. Season return to MC for further announcement. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for Mrs. Ani Setianingrum, M.E.S.Y. for leading session and thank you for Mrs. Nadia L. Mulhi, Ph.D. for delivering interesting presentation. Hopefully all the participants can implement the material into their life. And also thank you to the audience for being active participants. Ladies and gentlemen, we are closer to the end of agenda, but before we close this agenda, we would like to have the photo session of today's summer school. So today mm. we have five slides and we will count down for each slide. Okay. Uh, don't forget to open the camera for participants. Okay, I will count down right now. So one, two, three. Say cheese. One, next slide. One, two, three. Okay, the third slide. One, two, three. And the fourth. One, two, three. And the last slide. One, two, three. All right, thank you to all the participants. Well, we are coming to the end of agenda. To close this summer school today, let us recite Hamdalah together. Alhamdulillah, alamin. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. And as a reminder, tomorrow we still have another two session of YRC summer school. And don't forget to attend the station with the interest, interesting topic and of, and of course interesting speakers. And also, I want to remind everyone, don't forget to fill the post-test that will be open at 6.30 p.m. Wabilahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Nadia.